12, verses 3 through 21. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Just as each of you has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ, we who are many form one body. Gift is prophesying, let him use it in prophecy, <clears throat> proportion to his faith. If it is in serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is in contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the word of the Lord. Well, I looked up what the world's largest power plant is. And it's a hydro project in China, the Three Gorges Dam. It has five times the energy electricity output of the Grand Coulee Dam, which is the United States' largest power plant. The largest power plant is not a nuke facility, it's a hydro project, interestingly enough. So why did I look this up? Why did I care? Why am I bothering you with this? <laughs> because I wonder to myself, what would I do if I had all the service power that I could want? All the God-serving power of joyful, spirit-filled, -fill spirit-led service. I made a little list when I was preparing this sermon of what I would want to do if I had all the power that I could want to serve and to make things happen. This is my list for Haynes America right here. I would want to break the power of addiction in our community so that not another soul has their life disrupted, their soul ripped apart by addiction. I would want to prevent family breakups so that every child has a mom and a dad that love each other in the house they grow up in, whether it's rich or poor. I would want to grow the church and fill it with young people so future generations could be uh, spared trouble and guided so they don't go astray. I would want to debunk arguments against the faith that are casually accepted as fact, even though they're dead wrong. I would want to disarm spiritual powers that work behind the scenes in our community, evil spirits that are invited by sin and idolatry. I would want to bring a renewed respect for the name of Christ and the beliefs of the church. That's my personal list of what I would do if I had all the power of the Three Gorges Dam in China, but instead of electricity, it would be service power, the power of Christians walking in faith and living out the humble attitude of Christ in their lives. Well, humble is where we begin. Ironically, 
talking about power and talking about what could be done with the power of God. But the place that service begins, and really, truly, the place where service ends, is humility. Service is an act of humility. The word service um, is diakonia, from which we get the term deacons, and it means waiting on tables, waiting on tables. But it's a, a word in Greek that refers to service, um, rendering service. And it's more than uh, just helpfulness. I did make this point when we were talking about the spiritual gift of service. A servant is not a general contractor. A servant isn't uh, recognized by how much they accomplish. A servant is recognized by their position. When Jesus said, I am among you as one who serves, and he washed the feet of the disciples, he, it was obvious that he was greater but that the way of Christ is to, to bring yourself under. Christ, as was alluded to in the prayer of confession, in Philippians chapter 2, Christ emptied himself and became a human being and became a servant, even to the point of obedience that led to his death on the cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place. Servanthood is humility, and that's the first thing that we see in this passage in Romans. I was hoping that I picked a decent passage to talk about service because it seems to be talking about a lot of things. Is it really a passage about service? And there, the editors of the New International Version did me a favor and they labeled the paragraph humble service in the body of Christ. Thank you. That's what I needed. This is about service. So the three points are verse three, humility, verses four through eight, interdependence, and verses 9 through 21, love. Service that is part of our core values, the fourth of our eight core values in this church. Service that we are to render to God is humble, interdependent, and functioning out of a heart of love. So first, let's look at the humility. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment. It's sobering just to hear that. It's humbling just to hear that, but the beginning of service is to check our pride. Pastors are kind of the worst at this, unfortunately, so <laughs> I get to be example number one in my, you know, my uh, type of career. There's a book written that can get an ego and it can wreck their families and their ministries. There's the, the danger of getting an ego because you're the, uh, you know, a, a shepherd. I won't get into that, but one pastor talked to my best friend and, and said something to him that he remembered. He shared this with me almost 30 years ago. He said, if you want to know if somebody really has a servant's heart, find out how they react when they're treated like a servant. Yeah, because, you know, pastor loves to be the one with the great ideas, but if somebody says, uh, just give me a cup of coffee, just make some coffees, we don't really care what you think, your ideas aren't important here. The pastor with a servant's heart say, yeah, are you decaf, regular, can I get you some cream and sugar? How many coffees do you need? Uh, they won't need to be heard, they'll be willing to be seen and not heard. That's a servant's heart, that's humility. What kind of grace did Paul get when he says, by the grace given to me? This is the kind of grace that Paul received that is the grace of humility. Paul, who was a Hebrew of Hebrews of the tribe of Benjamin, studied under Gamaliel, a, a, a Pharisee, all this huge resume of religious strength. Paul became a weakling. He didn't eat and didn't drink for three days and had to be led around by the hand when the grace of God touched his life and he encountered Jesus. And then for years, he uh, did seemingly nothing for the church, hiding away, learning, becoming a disciple, letting people who were less than him in training and in uh, genealogy, people that were less than him, teaching him the way of Christ for years and years. And then he became the missionary to turn the world upside down and gave us a good portion of our New Testament. That was the grace given to Paul, the grace that said everything that I valued, I considered rubbish. That's a much stronger word in Greek, but he cast it aside for what? One thing, knowing Christ. That's the grace that he received. That's humility. And when he says, measure yourselves by the faith that God has given you, that's 
uh, what that refers to. What Paul treasures now is his relationship with God. And uh, thank you for preaching my sermon before I preached it, Jim. That was awesome. One of the things it showed is that uh, we are interdependent. We depend on one another. That's the second point. We're interdependent. We function out of grace. We function with the gift that God has given us. We don't function out of our own strength, but we also function interdependently. Now, I want to just take a moment here while you brace yourself for whatever that's going to be and touch on what you have written in the fourth core value here. And thank you, Martha, for putting this in the email that went out. I thought that was very... Uh, This church is a community of believers who are equipped for service to the body of Christ and to the world. Oh, that's so great. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm just, maybe I'll just read it. But, uh, so that means we're serving each other, yes, but we also have service, a, a servant's attitude out in the community. Um, we have... Every Christian is called to serve. All Christians are called to serve. There's nobody who uh, is exempt from it. All of us have this duty of heart and of deed. And we're born with natural given talents and born again with spiritual gifts. So you have a combination of just natural abilities, kind of like the small hand that can reach in the jar, and spiritual abilities that God gives that are unique. Both of them are to be used in service as a gift to God and as a witness to the new life we have in Jesus. I think it's really brilliant how you put that because the service, you're not a general contractor. Your, your service is not measured by how much you accomplish. Your service is measured by your heart to God. It's an it's a act of worship to the Lord, your humble attitude. Just like Paul spent years simply learning your humble attitude to uh, live a life in humility toward God is a gift to the Lord himself. And when you wash the feet, metaphorically speaking, of others, humble yourself and, and honor others above yourselves, as it said in the scripture we read today, when you do that, you're offering praise and worship to God. So you, you said that well. It, it's also a witness to the new life you have. Jesus said, you're a city on a hill. Let your good deeds be seen before people so they'll give glory to your Father who is in heaven. It doesn't mean you show off, but it means, as I alluded to, sometimes God's children should be seen and not heard. In other words, they should see the way that you live, the way that you treat people, the kind of attitude you take, the way you respond when somebody says you are less than, when somebody tries to put you down, you bless and you don't curse. When they see that in you, and they see that you're not shaken, your ego isn't fragile, that you have a heart to do good, even when bad is done to you, but say, what's with this person? Come from human nature. That's what you said in your statement here. We believe the church to, should be a community where Christians see themselves as ministers. The word minister means servant. And uh, I'm a minister. I'm a servant. Great, hooray. It means I gotta, you know, have this attitude and do things, but it also means I'm ordained, I'm set apart. I, uh, the church has decided to put me in a position to do something in particular and to, to be in a certain position. That's you too. You've been ordained, set apart by God for ministry, for service, for that attitude and that heart that lifts up others, but it will be expressed in the deeds that you do as well. So nobody, uh, according to your own words, nobody is ex exempt from the calling of service. All right. Encouraged to discover and develop your natural talents and your spiritual gifts. That's really great how you put that. Both of those go to work. And then empowered to use them in service. The way the church is equipped is through the pastors, teachers, prophets, evangelists, equipped to be uh, built up in the unity of the faith. So it's your faith that equips you for service. As you truly believe, that's what will bring the fruit. And all the um, structure of the church helps your faith grow. All right. 
All this is to lead us into the concept of interdependence. This is what Paul says when he says in verse 4, just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body. So y'all can't do it by yourselves. This, the work of the church is an interdependent work. That's humbling. Even when you all by yourself witness to somebody and say a great word of encouragement, or you all by yourself shovel the snow off of somebody's roof, you didn't get the heart to serve or the words to say by yourself. Somebody brought you to kids' church down in the basement and had the, the little donkey on the flannel graph. Somebody told you, maybe your mom, the way you should live. And they were led by the principles of the Sermon on the Mount. Even if they didn't go to church, they still learned it. You were taught. And even if you do the most independent work you can imagine, it's not your own. We're shared. Now, to demonstrate this interdependence, I'm just going to give you some lists. Sometimes my sermon needs a list or two. So I've got some lists for you. I was in a deacon's meeting Thursday, and I said, help me out. I've got to preach. I need your help. I need to fill some space here, so I'm going to need your brains. And I had two pieces of paper. On one I wrote needs, and the other I wrote deeds. Things that need to be done and things that are being done. I'm going to start with the deeds. This is what our church is doing. Look for interdependence in this list. And already, just forgive me in advance if the thing that you're doing isn't listed on anything I say, all right? If, if I forgot you, you get to be a servant and say, how can I help, even though I'm not being recognized? All right, here we go. Deeds, vacation Bible school, meals to those in need, gifts to uh, mothers who just had babies, the firewood ministry, the prayer chain, the Valentine's tea, the alpha marriage course, youth ministry, baccalaureate service, service, blessing of the fleet, baptisms, the bell choir. You ever seen a one-person bell choir? <laughs> that's some teamwork, that's some interdependence. Shoe boxes, special offerings, the mission work, uh, missions that we support, encouragement notes, visits, the food pantry, the pastor's food pantry, which is almost empty, bless your hearts. Communion to the homebound, the Thanksgiving community dinner, uh, special services like Advent and Lent and uh, Thanksgiving, etc. Christian renewal teams, classes and small groups they're teaching, the kids' church, the prayer walk care packages sent to college students and early career folks, and memorial service. That was just really quick. Fill up a page. That's what we got. So here's what we put for needs in the community. And here you can see if the Holy Spirit's stirring you. If you feel like you've got the gigawatt power of service stirring up in your soul. And there might be some people who will join you. Listen to the needs that we thought of. And you'll hear some repetition. I got another list after this. There'll be more repetition. Meals for those in need. Leadership, teen outreach activities, help for the homeless, help for the mentally ill, drug rehab, Sunday school, Holy Spirit-filled congregation with openness to the Holy Spirit, worship, uh, updated and current books about ministry and faith, discipleship, unity, support and encouragement for single moms, elder care, uh, things that build community within the congregation like potlucks, etc., marriage counseling, things that coordinate our gifts and abilities, building renewal, like the plans that you'll see February 12th, uh, financial counseling, and defense for life, maybe beginning of life, end of life, healing for those in the community who've been touched by crisis pregnancies, etc. That was a list that came up. Now, uh, stick with me. This is more lists than we usually do, and hopefully there's something coming up in some of these, but I before the deacons meeting, I made a list of thank yous. And you'll hear repetition, but I still want to give you my thanks. And in this, I'm hoping that you'll see how we depend on each other. And maybe you'll see that God is stirring you to keep going or to start something new. Thank you for honoring each other's birthdays in various ways. Thank you for honoring the birth of new babies around town. Thank you for helping people with firewood. Thank you for cooking meals for each other. Thank you for visiting people in nursing homes and hospitals, especially when they're in great pain or near death. Thank you for calling one another. 
to see how a person is doing. Thank you for telling each other about good words of truth and books and other social media. Thank you for cheering each other's kids on in their activities. Thank you for teaching. Thank you for purchasing, preparing, serving, and distributing food to people who are struggling financially. Thank you for watching over those with mental illness with care and wisdom. Thank you for welcoming new people who are strangers to the church or the community. Thank you for serving on boards or in partnerships with organizations that do good in the community. You do a lot, congregation. You do a lot. Thank you for your volunteer EMT and fire service. Thank you for your professional service in school, law enforcement, fire, EMT, counseling, health care, and just about everything. If you've ever lived in a town that has nothing, you know how important the grocery store is and the saw sharpening shop and mechanics. Everything we have in town is a blessing. So thank you, all of you. You just make a living and it helps people. Thank you for your humble and patient responses to strife, contention, anger, and argument. Thank you for your commitment to the most important and impactful service organization, the only one that specializes in eternal life, your local congregation. <coughs> Thank you for serving your parents, your spouse, your children, your extended families. Thank you for putting the needs of your coworkers above your own. Thank you for honoring others above yourselves. Thank you for recognizing you can't bring a suitable offering of service to the Lord without the help of others. All right. From a heart of humility, a heart that is touched by faith, these things are happening. And you can't uh, thank yourself. You have to look and see that they're happening because the Spirit of God is moving among you and you're helping one another. You're interdependent. So now the last section of Scripture is this beautiful section that has all these uh, words of instruction for us. And if all you had for Bible was verses 9 through 21 of Romans chapter 12 and the information of the gospel, that Christ died for your sins and you have a relationship with him through the Holy Spirit, you could live a really godly Christian life. Love must be sincere. Claim to what's good. Hate what's evil. Be devoted to one another. Don't be lacking in zeal. All these words bless those who persecute you. These are words that describe a heart of love that is not simply a sentiment of love, but a posture of humility and service, honoring others above yourselves. And the time that is the hardest is when you're offended, when people are cursing you. That's the hardest part, to bless those who curse you and, and to love them. It's all summarized by this phrase, don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Overcome evil with good. I gotta tell you about a mission trip that I went on. I led a youth group on in 2008. In May of 2008, Cedar Rapids was blasted with a terrible flood. A lot of Iowa had a terrible flood. I moved there in October of 2008. The next summer, we led a mission trip to Cedar Rapids, and there was a bigger church that was overseeing it all. And while we were getting trained and prepped, they told us about what had happened the week before. You know, Lord forgive me if I got any of these details wrong, but what had happened the week before is that a group had gone and knocked on a door and saying, we're here with such and such a church, we got some tools, we want to help you with your flood damage. And the woman stood there sort of bewildered and said, okay, come on in. One of the sensitive members of the team knew she needed to talk, so she sat down with her with a cup of tea and talked, and lo and behold, a letter to the Lord. This woman was hungry for God. They did some work, they tore out some drywall, and then the woman let their party know as they were leaving that right before they knocked on the door, she had made a, a, a certain plan to end her life, and she was all prepared, she was all ready. She's just exhausted and couldn't take any more. When they knocked on the door, they didn't just fix up her basement a little bit. They saved her life. You can come in with hammers and saws 
and a big attitude and, and not have love, then you won't have that same impact. But if you come with love, it's a servant's heart. It'll do a lot more than you hope to accomplish. So friends, uh, we, we serve humbly, we serve interdependently, and we serve with love. Now just one thought as we bring this to a conclusion. I began the sermon by talking about power. And I just would love for my list to be complete. I'd love it if all the things that could be done through Christian service were just done. That's a thought about power. Where does this power come from? Where does the authority to do all these things come from? Jesus was asked by, by the Pharisees, well, with what authority do you do these things? I'll tell you where Jesus' authority comes from according to the scripture. Jesus' authority comes from his humble service, his humility and his servanthood. He was very God. He was God, the creator, who became a human being and humbled himself. He allowed John the Baptist, a human being whose life existed because Jesus, the pre-existent God, called him into existence. He let his cousin John baptize him. And then he began his ministry and was filled with authority to cast out demons and heal the sick. But Jesus humbled himself even further and died on the cross for us. And when he rose from the dead and ascended into heaven, he poured out the Holy Spirit with the Father. And now even greater things are done because the Holy Spirit's been poured out. Because Jesus emptied himself and died on the cross, he was given the name that's above every name so that every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. His Humility was the source of his authority in his ministry on earth. And that's our model. We cannot accomplish great things through great pride. We accomplish great things through great humility, great service, great love. And the greatness of our accomplishment really is simply our gratitude to God. God is the contractor. We're the servants. God is the one with the blueprints. We're the ones who listen and say, yes, Lord, we will go. So, looking for a challenge? Want something to do? Want some homework? This is your homework, and I'd love to have you share it with me when you've done it. I'd like you to make a list like I made, a, a wish list, a service list, a gigawatt power station list. What would you have done in Haynes, in your community, in your circle of friends, if, if, if the service power was there, if the power of the Holy Spirit working through people was there, what would you accomplish? What would you have done? What are the needs that would be met? And I'd love to see your list. So may the Lord bless us with humility, with the grace that was given to the Apostle Paul. May the Lord show us good, good things. And may we give all the glory to him when it's complete. Amen. Hey, guess what? I'd like you to stand and pass the peace with one another. Peace. Peace. Right. It's gonna get better, man.